In today's video, I want to discuss a well-known child development theory and how it has caused so many issues for both children and parents. Hi, it's Anna here. Welcome back to my channel, the best place for parents or educators who want to learn and evolve with their children. Today, I want to discuss the behaviorism theory and why I strongly believe it is responsible for so many ineffective, but unfortunately so common, discipline practices, both at home and at school. And this topic is so close to my heart because I have seen my younger brother, but also my oldest child, really struggle in, within the current school system because of this. First, I will discuss what behaviorism is, then I will discuss its limitations, and then I will explain why I'm such a big proponent of developmentalism instead. Behaviorism, also known as behavioral psychology, is a theory of learning based on the idea that all behaviors are acquired through conditioning, and we get this conditioning through interactions with our environment. There are two areas of behaviorism. The first one is called classical conditioning, and the second one is called behavioral or apparent conditioning. The first one, classical conditioning, was discovered by the Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov, and you may be familiar with his famous experiment with dogs. He showed that when a bell was sounded each time the dog was fed, the dog then learned to associate the sound with the feeding time. And once conditioned, the dog would associate the bell sound with food by salivating simply in response to a bell tone, regardless if food was present or not. This is famously referred as the Pavlov effect. So it's about linking two stimuli together to produce a new learned response in a person or animal, basically learning through association. So any objects or events can trigger a conditioned response. Some examples of classical conditioning are when you get anxious when someone else's phone rings because they are using the same ringtone as your alarm clock in the morning. Or getting anxious before sitting for an exam is also typical classical conditioning. It's about the meaning we have learned to associate with exams. The second one is behavioral or apparent conditioning, and it was first developed by John Watson and later further developed by Frederick Skinner, who were both American psychologists. They thought classical conditioning was too simplistic to be a complete explanation of complex human behavior. In a nutshell, they believed that all action require a reaction, positive or negative, which then modifies the behavior, and when a certain deliberate behavior is reinforced, that behavior will become more common. John Watson famously claimed that if he were to be given a dozen healthy infants, he could shape them into anything, doctors, lawyers, artists, beggars, or thieves, regardless of their background or genetic predispositions. With this theory, the individual is passive and behavior is molded through positive and negative reinforcement, positive and negative punishments. This means that a child's behavior can be changed and modified through reinforcement. Their theory basically started the whole movement of behavioral modification therapies, reward charts, behavior charts, timeouts, and other punishments that are so prevalent in so many parenting books and parenting practices. And our current school system is based on this behaviorism theory. So now let's discuss why I think behaviorism has caused a lot of issues for children and parents. And to start with, let me be clear. I can certainly see the appeal of using behavior modification techniques, especially in the school system where a teacher has 20 to 30 kids in each class and a jam-packed curriculum. It is very easy to implement, very black and white, and can often produce quick results for a good proportion of students. And just as a side note, my mother was a school teacher for 20 years in France, so I do have the utmost respect for teachers. It is such a difficult job, and the problem definitely lies within the overall system, not the teaching profession. And certainly, we all love to get praise or some form of positive reinforcement from time to time. But I see really two big limitations with this theory. The first one is that it is way too simplistic. It solely focuses on observable external behaviors without taking into account what's happening internally. It doesn't take into account cognitive abilities or emotional skills that are such a huge piece of the behavior puzzle. This is why it can be seen as working well for simple behavior problems or children who already have the cognitive and emotional abilities to problem solve, tolerate frustration, be flexible and adaptable and follow rules. I really do believe that children do well at school and respond well to rewards and punishments when they already have the skills to do so. 
And I've seen this in action with my younger brother, as I mentioned earlier, but also with my two kids. I've got two kids in school and my eldest really struggled when she started her first year at school. She was in trouble a lot of the time because she really struggled with all the rules and concentrating for the whole day. But my second child, she just recently started school and she's loving it, following all the rules and everything. So two children, the same parent, the same parenting style, and two completely different school experiences. The second big issue that I see with this theory is that it creates a generation of people who value external gratification over intrinsic motivation. When you do something for a reward rather than the enjoyment of the process itself. But the problem with this is that it only produces short-term results by giving a small boost in interest and motivation, but it can actually be detrimental in the long term. Certain psychologists even indicate that focusing too much on external motivators can create dependencies. While an occasional reward can provide an extra boost of motivation, it's important not to rely on them all the time. Constantly getting rewards for accomplishments may stand in the way of children being able to develop into independent learners and consequently independent workers. So the reality is that we need both. We need a lot of interesting motivation with a sprinkle of external motivators. For example, I'm still a big proponent of medals um, for competitive sport, for example. Or a reward can be really good when there is a specific task that you really don't want to do. It can be a, an extra boost. But when you only do something because of the reward that you get, say for example, an award for good behavior at school, it can lead to self-esteem issues where you crumble next time you don't get the award. And let's face it, you won't always be able to get the award. Or you can completely lose motivation when the reward is taken away. Or something that I've seen happen actually also is that it can backfire where your child actually refuses to do anything else unless they get a reward for everything. So what's an alternative theory then? After reading about 20 parenting books, and also based on my experience as a mom of three, because I've actually experimented a lot over the years, I wasn't always a respectful parent. I think the best parenting approach is developmentalism. And by that, I mean simply understanding child development, learning and accepting a child's cognitive, physical, and emotional abilities at any given age. And this is why I've already done quite a few videos on what to expect at different ages. And each child is definitely unique. So you should really observe and listen to your own child to get to truly know them. But these videos provide a nice guideline as some behaviors are highly predictable. A behaviorist looks at the behavior that the child is displaying and asks, how do I change it? And this is the approach that you find in many parenting books or how-to strategies and the approach that's taken in school. So these strategies are things like sleep training, timeouts, reward charts, loss of privileges, teaching a lesson. And all these strategies are about molding the child's behavior. But the problem is that consequences and strategies are like a band-aid solution that leaves the root of the problem unaddressed. It's like taking an aspirin when you have a headache, but in actual fact, your recurring headaches are because of poor eyesight. So your headaches won't go away until you get new glasses. Or you may be familiar with the analogy of the iceberg. It's basically solely focusing on the tip of the iceberg. A developmental approach to parenting looks at what's underneath the iceberg and then ask, why is my child displaying this behavior? What is the need behind it? Are my expectations developmentally appropriate for my child? How can I support him or her through this? So as parents, committing ourselves to learning about and understanding the neurobiological and developmental realities of our children allow us to meet them where they are, on their playing field. Because without that, we tend to project onto them and attribute to them traits and capabilities that not only they do not possess, but that they are not supposed to possess at this age. And because children are so good at repetition, meaning that they can simply observe an action or hear a word and repeat it, we often misinterpret this by them fully understanding it. But our child repeating a clever sentence that they've heard someone say, really does not mean that they fully grasp the meaning behind it. They are in fact limited by the realities of brain development. 
When you understand child development, you then understand that young children's outlook on life and the world is largely egocentric and black and white until about seven years old, and their executive function doesn't fully mature until their mid-twenties. And this understanding allows you to accept that your child won't always be able to share their toys, think of the consequences before acting, manage their emotions, and think rationally. Does that mean that you do nothing? Absolutely not. Your job is to support and guide them by providing boundaries when necessary. But it means that you can set up your child for success as much as possible and not put unrealistic expectations on them. So this means evaluating if a boundary needs to be changed, evaluating if some part of your relationship needs to be strengthened. And if it's neither of those things, it means remaining open, calm and supportive to your child's big emotions in response to that boundary. So there you go. This video is about the theory that in my mind is responsible for so many problematic strategies with children that simply do not work in the long term. And unfortunately, it has really changed our parenting mindsets for the worse. So this video is an invitation for you to really get to know your child, learn about child development, watch the video summaries that I've already done on what to expect at different ages. So you can really start to embrace your child as they are, meet them where they are without trying to change them. And most importantly, be patient. You cannot rush the child development process, but you can learn to trust it. Parenting and childhood is a marathon, not a sprint. That's it for today. If you have enjoyed this video, please leave me a like and please leave me a comment and introduce yourself. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching and keep growing.